And I see we're live. Well, welcome everybody. And I'm Stephen hey. Petro. <laughs> Hold on, guys. I'll get to you. Uh, I'm Stephen Petro. I'm a BCCA fellow. I'm a board member. And by day, I'm a columnist for the Washington Post. And tonight, I'm here to moderate the first ever VCCA presidential debate <laughs> between <laughs> novelist Ron Shavers, who's in the lower portion of my screen right now, and visual artist Jay Petro. And they have agreed to tonight's rules, which were devised by the president of the board of the VCCA, no rules. that is Quinn Feldman Grave Esquire, someone you don't want to mess with. And gentlemen, these are the rules. Be empathetic. Be respectful, <laughs> keep to the time limits that we have discussed, and no personal attacks. So, do you agree, Ron? No puppet, no puppet. <laughs> yeah, you're on board? I yeah. am. No no brotherly attacks. <laughs> That's no brotherly attacks. And um, uh, for everyone who is not familiar with the Brothers Petro, Jay is my brother, Ron is my friend, and we're going to start with Ron tonight. So Jay, we'll bring you back in, in the middle of the show. Okay. And um, also want to just tell everybody who's out there, please ask questions in the comments section here. We will be taking questions for both Ron and Jay at the very end. And, um, and we look forward to that. So Ron is my friend. Ron is a fellow board member here. And um, he has published, I believe this is your, your debut novel, Ron. Isn't that right? Yep. That's Silverfish. Over. And um, I love the words that are used to describe it, which I'm going to ask you to talk about later if you don't, but mm -hmm. um, especially Afrofuturism, which was, um, I think, a new genre for me. But um, the reviews have been really great, and um, you are great. So I think you're going to start off by doing a reading, and, um, and then we'll go from there. Okay. I'd also be remiss if I did not say, because of the Brooklyn Book Fair, you can actually get this at 30% off if you go to the Clash, Book, Clash Books website. As well, every Clash book is 30% off. Um, the website is www.clashbooks.com. And once again, the code for 30% off code is Brooklyn Book Fair, BKBF. Once again, that code for 30% off is BKBF. And thanks, everybody, for showing up. Um, really flattered and honored. Okay, so I guess I'm gonna read a little bit from the text and um, yeah, then we'll just take it from there. Uh, for those of you that already have the book, namaste. Um, this is from chapter four, which is page 12. And I'll just read the whole thing. This is a setup between them. Um, and those that are just sort of kind of silverfish curious, it's a little setup between, well, they're these combat associates. They aren't called soldiers anymore. They're called combat associates. But after every mission, they have to be debriefed by a financial planner. And so this is sort of what happens. Machinist Clayton, please sit back on the bio bed while I calibrate it for your standard debriefing. Financial planner for a new unit, I'm bound by law to remind you that pursuant to the corporate code of civilized nations, during the debriefing process, your word is bond. Any derivation from the absolute truth constitutes fiduciary negligence and will result in liens being placed on all of your collateral assets and accounts, as well as more severe penalties. Now, with that said, Clayton, you have information I need and I have advice to give, so let's trade. Tell me what happened. Silverfish, sir. Silverfish? You were dropped into primitives. How'd they get silverfish? Do you know how much they cost? Don't know, sir. The acquisition and employment of silverfish is above my pay grade. Well, they're currently at 2.6 million per. Primitives don't invest like that. Did you notice any uh, Chinese or Eurozone units? Any other major capital investors out there? Investors? I don't know, sir. I saw what I saw. One minute the angel's destroying every prim in sight, and the next there is a wave of silverfish swarming everything. And I mean everything. And then how'd you survive? Protocol zero, sir. Standard machinist protocol zero. I ran the other way and stripped. I dropped all metal, plastic, and polymers. I'm almost organic, sir. All my implants are deep in bed. A machinist has gotta be. I don't have the liquid assets for anything else, but uh, I saved up a few options. Wait, 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 stop. Your word is bond, Clayton. So let's be honest with each other. An embed is an embed to a silverfish. They should have eaten you. The bio bed is recording your autonomic functions. So if you follow up and determine you've been lying. Sir, never, sir. I need this job. But sir, you know what it's like out there. I've seen the pertinent view feeds. I know what it's like. 
but today didn't go according to plan. It's not what we planned, Clayton. Doesn't that mean something to you? Sir, I survived my fourth jump and I've got options. I'm thinking flight school. Not after the day you are. not With our angel missing, you're at risk of entering default. Corporate needs a satisfactory, exp a satisfactory explanation of what happened. Where's our angel and just how did you survive? Sir, I stripped naked. I took everything off. Do you ever seen a silverfish up close, sir? It's all teeth. They, they burrow into people. Check the records, sir. Look. Please lower your voice, machinist Clayton. As this unit's financial advisor, need I remind you that any interaction we may have, real, virtual, or digital, may be recorded for quality and insurance purposes. The use of inappropriate or hostile words, actions, and attitudes towards a unit towards a unit's financial planner is a category two felony. No, no, sir. Thank you, sir. I survived because I stuck close to the angel, sometimes in front, sometimes in back. I'm a machinist, so I'm supposed to stick near him anyway. I know his capacities and blast radius, and what a lot of combat and associates don't know is if you DNA ID with an angel before you jump, you won't get shot. That's in the manual. An angel won't shoot you if you share the same mission. Most prims can't get close enough to kill an angel, and an angel doesn't do friendly fire, not unless it's ordered to. That's also in the manual, the field manual, and if you let the angel do its job, then you've got nothing to worry about so long as you stick near. I'm the machinist. I'm not authorized to carry a lot of gear in the field. My gear is the angel. But you lost it, Clayton. Where is it? I know, sir, and I'm sure this one's a she, but uh, but they had silverfish. They'd been fed and were already growing by the time they swarmed. They swarmed us and they were looking for more. The silverfish probably ate us, sir. And what about the primitives? They just let you live? Yeah, well, no. No, sir. The angel is efficient, sir. Even before the swarm, there weren't that many prims around, or at least none in any condition to catch me. I ran, sir. I ran naked all the way back to the safety zone. The fish were already there when I made it, but I had nothing they wanted, so they just ignored me. And that's the truth, sir. I, I got a bonus for it before. If you check the records, my first jump. Yeah, I see it. I see it. You were pulled up with a hemp rope then, but today we had to vacuum lift you out at considerable risk and expense. The two outcomes aren't comparable, Clayton. I'm afraid the best I can offer you at this time is a stagnant position, one that will keep your financial situation as is, not accounting for its standard pre and after tax expenses and the common suite of applicable pay grade deductions, of course, but um, two more jumps in your portfolio will no doubt rebound. And while you could exercise an option in this volatile market, I'd caution against it. The outcomes wouldn't be very good. Do you understand the machinist, Clayton? Yes. Good. Then in my capacity as advisor, let's go over your current scenario. I see you've applied to a drone pilot school using your first mission option. Hmm, that's an exciting but a risky and volatile opportunity. The biofeedback on drones is tough to safely measure, but I commend your decision. For pay grades such as yours, wetware is a very stable investment opportunity that, yield, that yields a lot of long-term growth potential. However, my advice is that you don't exercise those options just yet. They're the only thing keeping your credit rating up and the after-tax penalty Seriously, it would kill you. I don't make the decisions, but they'd be. At your current social pay grade, Clayton, you can't afford an exemption waiver on biofeedback and any instance of it will result in an unfortunate but swift termination due to misallocation of initial investment funds. So instead, I'd recommend you take two more jumps and then request a lateral move to diversify your ranking portfolio, then cash in all your options at once. Two more jumps. Just two more to remove your emotional risk indicators, and I'd say you're in a much, much better fiscal position. Understood? Two more jumps, sir? But the, um, but the max is seven. With two more, I'll be at six. Yes, but think about the positive financial outlook. Any scenario two or greater jumps, and you'll, be, you'll graduate to the next tax bracket. It's practically win-win. Unless I die. Well, you signed the harvest clause, right? If you die, your parts get harvested and redistributed. We're all part of the great global economy, Clayton, and this gives you a sizable amount of liquid assets to pass along to your children, should you choose to have them. After your tour is complete, feel free to look into signing up for an account at Breeders Bank. The officers there are trained to assist you in helping you to find a mate, pending application approval, of course. Fine, just two more jumps then, right? Yes. Then I'll sign. Where do I sign? Here, and here, and here, and initial here. Thumbprint here. Glad to have you back on board, Clayton. Glad to be back on board, sir. Any further duties required of me? No. Any further statements you'd like to make? No, not that I can. Well, well, yeah, just one. 
Can I, um, can I swap liabilities? Hurley wasn't the best commander, you know. Well, technically you could, but not unless you want his job. His position is available. Would you like it? My offer is time sensitive, so I need to know now, right now. Two jumps, that's it? Yes, two jumps. The no. No, I think I'll stick with the duties of my pay grade. Very well then, I think we're done here. Best of luck to you, Clayton, and it's been a pleasure to serve with you. Thank you, sir, and it's been a pleasure to serve you. And that's it, thank you. Thank you very much. That's great, Ron. You, and the comments are reflecting that you're getting um, thumbs up from everybody. <laughs> there you go, beautiful book, like it says. A beautiful book. And, uh, thank you. So um, before we turn to our next fellow, I have two public service announcements. Okay. Um, the first is, I'm drinking this very nice wine. It's called Lubanzi. Mm -hmm. The reason I'm going to tell you about it is Lubanzi, this bottle of Chenon Blanc, was a gift from our friends over at Sweetbriar, John Gregory Brown and Carrie Brown. Their son, Walker Brown, is the co-founder of this winery, and it is great. So look them up online. Yeah. And um, my second PSA is that you didn't know that it's election season. And um, so I just want to remind everybody a couple of things. Make sure you're registered to vote. Um, if you intend to vote by mail, request an absentee ballot now. If you feel safe voting in person, choose the location in your county that you want to vote in and read up on the candidates. And I um, also want to encourage you to um, help get other people out to vote. I don't think there's a more important election than this one in our lifetime, frankly. So, um, so now shifting gears, it's a pleasure for me to introduce my brother. Jay Petro. There you are, Jay. There I am. And uh, Jay is joining us from Westport, Connecticut, and he is a visual artist and, and a landscaper and a two-time fellow. So Jay is going to give us um, a little tour of his work over time, and then we'll take questions for both Ron and for Jay. So welcome, brother. Thanks, Stephen. Thanks for having me. And uh, I really want to thank uh, BCCA for uh, giving me this time to show my work, but a lot of this work was developed during my two residencies at BCCA. And um, so I just want to um, give you sort of some background of where I came from. Uh, I am an abstract painter now, but this is where I was uh, back when I was 21 years old. Uh, I was an art and biology major, and I was mostly doing realistic portraits. That's me on the left and my roommate on the right. Um, so, Around uh, 30 years later, after being a magazine art director, oops, sorry, for uh, a bit, uh, sorry, oops, not used to this. Okay. Um, so we had, we had a son, my, my wife and I, um, who has autism, and I hadn't really painted since those college paintings that I showed you. And there was a lot of upheaval, a lot of emotional stress at home. And I felt like I just needed to somehow express all of what I was feeling. And I had never done any kind of abstract work, uh, certainly not abstract expressionist. So I just started up doing it. And this is one of the first uh, pieces I've done. Uh, it's called Anger Washing Over Me. And I just would sort of get things out and wasn't really concerned about representing any object, representing any scene. I was mostly interested in representing what was happening inside of me, which to be honest, I wasn't always totally clear, but I would just sort of attack uh, the canvas with paint, with my hands, with brushes, and certain images would start to develop, um, but they were usually not intended. So I went through that period where it was really just a lot of putting stuff out there. But then I, I also wanted to, a couple of years later, this is like when I went to VCCA, I wanted to create some kind of narrative of what my son's world was like. And so I thought I needed to bring in some realistic imagery um, to sort of marry my expressive paintbrush, paint, paint uh, strokes. So. 
when I got to VCCA the first time, I, I did this painting the first day out of the box. Um, my son used to, uh, he used to probably would, likes to line up toys, line up cars. Um, he loves SpongeBob. He loves to play with the trains. Uh, so this picture sort of represented to me what William's world is like for him. Uh, you can see some of the details. Uh, we have an electric train. This was actually Steve's engine from when we were kids, under 10 years old. And I, I kept my toy soldiers and William would just sort of put together these scenes and he would just be playing with them for forever. And so I got that sort of feeling done and I thought, okay, so th the abstract expressionist kind of painting allowed me to loosen up when I was painting realistic things. So I started going back to some portraits. These are just models, um, just doing abstract faces. Um, just trying to see where I could create um, images, but in a much looser abstract way. At the same time I was doing SpongeBob, I also developed these abstract pieces at VCCA. And for me, this was like a big change because it was somewhat of a controlled use of forms and shapes, but there was still a lot of expressive brushstrokes that were happening. So my whole intention was to keep the energy and keep the emotional content of my painting, but start to develop an intentional, um, you know, form to the paintings. I sort of kept going with this uh, through, uh, I had another residency at Weir Farms in, in Connecticut. Um, and then I also, I'm doing a landscape design. So I'm using a lot of uh, different kinds of palettes of plants. And around the same time I started doing the abstract work, I started doing meadow design and, and these kind of very full uh, textured, colorful landscapes. And somehow these landscapes sort of popped into my abstract work. None of this was intended. It just, I didn't even notice it when I did it. And then I would sort of look at it and say, oh, you know, that looks like a bunch of boxwoods there. And on the right, that sort of looked like an ocean scene. Um, so my mind is sort of working in, in the same way when I'm doing these two, but then there's a lot of crossover. Um, again, developing these forms, I really get into the texture of the paint, <clears throat> the, this detail on the right. Uh, I like applying the paint really thickly and thin and working it with my hands and scratching into it um, just so that, um, I think it's developing layers that create interest and depth and the, the layers are more what I am trying to develop within myself and figure out who I am. I also work large and small. These are actually 12 inch squares, um, paintings. It's, it's an interesting process going back and forth for me. Um, I, I find that sometimes the bigger ones, it seems like a little overwhelming to start and the small ones, it's like, oh, this is very relaxing, but I've got to put a lot of energy into those as well. Um, so after the problem or not the problem, but one of the issues that I've found is like when I'm working, doing landscape design, I'm really focused on the landscape. Then when I'm going to these re residencies in the winter and painting, I'm very focused on the painting and there's not, it's not an easy way to transition from one to the other or from the paintings that I've been doing the previous like six months before. And it was a little bit frustrating for me. Uh, this is one I was sort of trying to go back to some of those earlier things I'd shown. Um, but this is my process. This is actually on the right is the finished painting. On the left is where this painting started. And this developed over a month. And I wasn't really happy with where it was at any point. But for me, that's okay, because I'll just keep painting over it and keep pushing it. And I'm reacting to what I'm seeing on the painting versus trying to think about what I want it to be beforehand. So it's, it's a process that can really continue forever. Um, but at a certain point, I feel like 
I'm happy with it, so I stop. Um, and then I'm just gonna go through maybe you know a few few more paintings that I've done. Uh, I don't have like I guess I'm not developing a a series yet. Um, I'm really just exploring where I want to go that day, that morning, that evening when I'm painting. They're uh, sort of different color palettes I'm using. Some softer, some more harsh, or some brighter colors. Um, trying to keep that energy up, um, but just just playing around. Um, none of these were preconceived where I was going with them. They just happened. Um, some of them develop well and easily, and others take a little more time. Um, this one. Uh, it's sort of people have said it looks like a, a sandwich. To me, it looks like an island, an upside down island with a palm tree. Um, but someone said it looked like a croissant sandwich. But I, I find that interesting for me to see different things and for other people to pull out things that they see in my paintings that, you know, again, are not intended. Uh, this ain't no disco. Uh, this is the painting, uh, one of the last I've done. Uh, back in January, I uh, started using a little more blacks. Still a lot of movement, but it's not as wild as the first few paintings I showed you. Uh, and this was the last one. And this this painting was based on, uh, I was looking out at the blue sky with the icicles in January up in Vermont. I was at uh, Vermont Studio Center. And I just decided to do a blue painting and pretty much stuck with that. Um, it's one of my calmer ones, I would say. But so that's it. Um, thanks for listening. Thanks for looking. And uh, back to you, Steve. Thanks, Jay. That was great. And Ron, you're going to join us too, I believe. Um, sure. I actually have a Jay Petro Blue series myself. And I don't know if you can see with this light, but there really is a lot of texture. I mean, that um, this gold part, um, it's. It's thick, and I love it, Jay. Uh, so before we take your questions, let me thank Kim Doty, who is behind the scenes as our producer and wizard. None of this would happen in terms of organization and promotion and technical stuff without Kim. So Kim, thank you. And thank you for the bi-weekly newsletter that you do, which was called Wednesday Lemonade, and now I believe it's called Wednesday Cider. And I'm hoping maybe it'll be Wednesday hard cider before we before too long. <laughs> so, um, and um, in the in the public comments, I can only see people who are writing there, so I don't know everybody who is listening right now. But it is just great to see old friends and um, Doris and David and um, Lex and um, and your friends too. So thank you. And if you have any questions, any more questions for Ron and Jay, please post them there. Okay, I'm going to start with the first question for you. You know, and I'm thinking about you know your abstract, your abstract work, and then your landscape work. And um, is your creative process the same in developing a painting and and a garden, or are they really are they different kinds of processes? Um, so I, I do more planning when I'm designing gardens, but since I've been doing these meadows. Uh, I'll put the, the kinds of plants I want in a certain area and I'll develop sort of anchors to that landscape. But I actually prefer to sort of move the plants around freeform when I'm out there in the garden before they're planted. And so there's a little bit more form developed there. And I'm trying to create that form in my paintings as well, but not lose the looseness of it. Um, so it's definitely this, a similar process, yeah. Great, thanks. So Ron, um, your book is described as an experimental book uh, mm -hmm. by many. And um, I'm curious as to what you mean by that and even if you agree with that. Um, that's a great question, yeah. Like, I mean, more or less, it's not a conventional novel in any sort of respect, meaning that um, my main concerns aren't really about plot or theme or characterization. 
you know, it's not sort of like a rousing tale where our hero overcomes complications and then gets the girl or something like that. <laughs> you know, um, <laughs> I mean, it's more just sort of about me kind of just geeking out about language and everything else. And I mean, there is a lot of thematic stuff in there, you know, like that's not to totally discount any of that because it's all kind of packed in there, but it's sort of not my main concern. Um, I wanted to, or sometimes I like to call it just a beautiful mess. Mm -hmm. you, know, um, you know, just like um, Jay, like when you were showing your paintings and you said, oh, I'll, I'll just, you know, I'll, I'll paint it over this. I'm not exactly like happy with it yet, but you know, it's like sometimes you just keep pushing through until you kind of arrive at, at what it is that you want to see and how you want to see it or what it is that you want to, um, you want the narrative to look like and, and how you'd like it to read. So mm -hmm. that's, that's part of what, or at least that's part of it, you know? Okay. Yeah. Um, Ann Stagg has a question for you, Ron. Mm -hmm. And um, she posted, is Silverfish a standalone book or part of a series? Um, nope, it's, uh, it's pretty standalone, right? I mean, like, it's, I actually, well, I wrote a lot of it at VCCA actually throughout the years. Um, and I kind of did what I called overwriting, meaning that I knew I, I wrote like, there was one, I think my first time at VCCA, I actually wrote out just sort of the entire backstory and then what would even happen a hundred years in the future, 500 years in the future, et cetera, et cetera, knowing that it was never gonna appear. Um, and then I worked to kind of pare it down, 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 down as much as possible. Um, because I don't think it, it could, you know, no, it's a standalone book and it's a really kind of small, thin one. <laughs> it, should, it should be a series. <laughs> Maybe, I might revisit it, who knows? But at, at this point, it's like, as long as it just, it needs to be. I see that Sheila Gully Pleasance is in the house and we say, <laughs> all of us say hello to you, Sheila. <laughs> yeah. hey, Sheila. <laughs> so I have a question for the two of you. Mm -hmm. This comes a little bit from my first residency at VCCA. And I remember I was lost in something that I was writing. And um, that I was actually, I was talking to a visual artist and she said, oh, you're experiencing the middle model. When you get to the middle of something and you don't know which way is forward, which way is back and you're lost, it's okay. It's a normal part of this process and you know, stay with it and you'll come out of it. So I'm wondering, you know, for you two, um, I'm going to assume you have some creative blocks from time to time. How do you get past them? And Jay, you go first. Um, so typically, I, I don't have too many blocks because I don't really know where I'm going when I start. So my process is put a bunch of paint on my palette and start throwing it on the canvas. I do get stuck in places and then I'll throw up another canvas and start again. But I'll, I'll start to tell myself, just put paint out and just start painting. Because when I can turn off my thinking process and let my sort of inner, you know, abilities to just create, uh, the work is better and it, I'm not stopping myself from like overthinking things. Uh, it stays fresher, yeah. Mr. Shavers? Oh, cool. Yeah, I forgot this was a debate. I should have interrupted like 15 times. <laughs> <laughs> Shut up, man. Shut up, man. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I'd have to I'm sort drinking. of say. I'm drinking that talk to rewind. What can I say? Go ahead. <laughs> um, I'd have to sort of second that. I think it was like Walter Avish that said, I write to discover what I'm writing about, you know. Um, but as well, I mean, sort of that's that's one half of the coin. The other half was was actually kind of writing this book, you know, um, because because for I was blocked beforehand, and for the longest time, well, I got kind of stuck in a rut in which I felt everything I had to do had to be sort of uber literary, you know, without any kind of ill definition of what that was, and so I just said, you know, forget it. Um, I'm, you know. I'm just gonna go. I'm gonna go crazy, right? Or not crazy, but you know, it's just like I'm going to go ahead and and write something that doesn't necessarily depend on all the kind of conventional modes of you know 
of how like or it's not a commercial novel by any means i'm just going to keep repeating that um, but that middle muddle that you're talking about and then i promise i will shut up is um you don't need yeah. to shut up <laughs> <laughs> it's sometimes you know just writing your way through it um you know not everything you do has to ever see the light of day or at least like that's kind of how i help it's just like sometimes i'll just write crap just to write crap or knowing that i'm going to find like the diamond in the lump of coal somewhere you know yeah. at some point i think if i could interrupt um <laughs> <laughs> when, you, when you start to put pressure on yourself mm -hmm. for the end result yeah you can get stuck and right. i was doing that this past January when I got to VCCA because I, I wanted to continue where I was and I liked where I was and I couldn't get there and I was really frustrated. So then I just said, all right, I'm just gonna be where I am right now and just paint what I can paint now and not worry about it. And it, it worked out. Yeah. So I think, I think putting pressure on yourself is really not a good thing as a creative person. Yeah, no. It doesn't help. I thought it was, you know, it's always, it's always so helpful when when you meet people at BCCA who are in different genres who we all speak the same language and um, I've said this before I feel like I'm really with you know, my own people when I'm at a residency like BCCA um, as opposed to the rest of the world. Um, Ron, I'm going to come back to you in a second with a question, but um, since the entire Petro family is watching Jay, uh, and there's a question from our sister, I know I need to ask you that, otherwise. Um, Big, big trouble. Sorry, Ron, it's a little nepotism going on. <laughs> um, uh oh. So, Jay, our sister asked the first time of your favorite artists, and um, did any one of them influence your work in particular? Uh, yeah. Um, um, Jean Michel Basquiat, uh, certainly a big influencer. Um, someone who's a little bit more contemporary is Carrie Moyers who has these beautiful shapes and colors, but a lot of textures and some, um, a lot of the abstract expressionists from the 60s and 70s, like Kin Kandinsky and uh, Franz Klein, just the, the use of paint and their brush strokes, um, you know, just said, you don't have to paint anything that you're seeing, you can just paint. It's sort of uh, giving, giving the paint itself and the strokes the, the the stage versus an object that you're trying to represent and when you try and represent an object you're thinking again not you're not really fully expressing yourself possibly you know because you think okay it's got to look like that so maybe if you're writing a, a story and it has to be a certain way like commercial like ron was saying mm -hmm. um you might put parameters on yourself and i think when you try and paint um at, at least for me, when I was trying to represent something, it was, uh, I was, I had to think too much and I'm a better painter when I'm not thinking, if that sounds any good. <laughs> it does. So um, Ron, Lex, Lex Williford has this question for you. Um, he remembers reading a different story from the book last summer. He enjoyed your, and he enjoyed your reading tonight, but he's curious as to how you see your work in light of Afrofuturism, maybe beginning with Octavia Butler, and maybe telling us some of the Afrofuturist writers you love. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, well, Octavia Butler, yes, definitely. And, you know, Chip Delaney, there's a lot of Chip Delaney in the book, or Samuel R. Delaney. Um, like, really influential. Um, he would probably hate it, but, <laughs> but, but that's so. <laughs> like, but, but yeah, that's there. Um, also, just in light of, of sort of, Afrofuturism and just to kind of, you know, hit the nail in the head or whatever. Um, what is Afrofuturism? It's more or less sort of like addressing or, you know, Blacks addressing contemporary problems, usually mediated through a kind of science fictional lens. You know, if you think about the notion of the alien, for example, what's more alien than, you know, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing someone else here, Kojo Ashun, who says, what's more alien than sort of like, you know, being ripped from your land, put on a strange ship, taken somewhere, you know, that you don't recognize by people that, that look nothing like you, and then kind of having to go through that process. Um, you know, so it's a way of sort of addressing like contemporary problems, but, you know, in like 
just mediated through the lens of sci-fi. Um, and I totally forgot Lex's question, so I'm gonna look in again and see. Um, you you yeah. kind of got it. Yeah. Well, but yeah, I mean, there are also lots of contemporary authors that I would give a shout out to who are kind of doing this a lot better and for much longer, like Cherie Renee Thomas would be one. She started an anthology about, uh, or she did an anthology about 20 years ago almost now called Dark Matter, which was really influential, um, you know, and uh, I don't know, I, don't get me tempted. I'm just tempted to start pulling off books, my, pulling books off my shelf. Um, but yeah, I mean, sort of, it's like, it's, um, I find it a useful genre, although, um, but, you know, but it goes in all these various different directions, you know, so I think maybe I'll just stop there in terms of the answer, I think. <laughs> okay, and I'm going to actually give you the last question, Ron. Um, okay. And I'm not sure who, the, who this is, but um, could you talk a little bit more about the origins of the novella? How you conceptualized it, and I'm also curious. You know, when did you start writing? When did you start writing it? The book, mm -hmm. um, maybe 14 or 15. Um, I was in very early stages at, at VCCA um, writing the book, and that's when I said I, I wrote out. Um, you know, kind of like it takes place in a kind of undefined future period at some point they even stopped using just the regular calendar for you know the cycles of the dow etc cetera, etc cetera. um i kind of conceived of it well it was post-recession you know and and just like um and usually oddly enough i end up i usually start cooking sometime between say like six and seven i like to cook and you know so i'm listening to npr and marketplace you know and everything else and just but all the kind of language um you know that that all the kind of just language say that you hear used on wall street and kind of tossed about and everything else um you know it almost just does become sort of impenetrable at some point you know and i was just thinking sort of like what would be like sort of the next logical step in that um i mean there's a lot in there just you know i'm, I'm a big language nerd like i said so there's a lot in there about language um and so like that's sort of what what i was thinking and also just a kind of corporatization of culture overall you know, like everybody, you know, even, you know, you're not just yourself, you're a brand and you have to brand yourself and market yourself. And, you know, like even sort of influencers, it's like, what exactly do they do? Um, <laughs> I still don't get it, right? But, you know, um, so there was all that kind of stuff and just taking that to kind of its extreme conclusion, you know, um, and yeah. Well, thank you both. And um, hey, Kim, can you just pop in so everybody can see you if you don't mind? So I want to. Oh, yeah. And Peer pressure. Hey. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Kim, Hi, everyone. Kim, Hi, everyone. Kim, thank you so much for everything. You're well. very welcome. And um, to our executive director, Kevin O'Halloran, to our president of the board who devised rules that were very well um, followed tonight. Um, Quinn Grafe and um, and to all of you who were out there yeah. and um, participating. Thanks so much. Stay well. Be safe. Bye. Bye.